Hello everyone, welcome to the Tim Booker channel. I wish you a pleasant audiobook listening experience. Today, I'm going to interpret this book for you, titled, Micromastery. It's a very special book that presents a viewpoint that challenges common beliefs. The core idea is that even if you only have three minutes of enthusiasm, it's enough to learn a new skill. As you can see, this differs from the conventional perspective we've heard in the past. Previously, we believed that to learn a skill, you needed to invest a great deal of passion from the beginning, followed by diligent practice, spending time mastering it, and becoming a disciplined individual. This is the education we received since childhood, hard work, perseverance, and persistence. There's also the recent 10,000-hour rule that has been proposed. However, the author of this book believes that the problem with not being able to persist in learning lies fundamentally in our misconceptions about learning. We've made the process of mastering something new seem too difficult. The author of this book, Robert Twigger, graduated from Oxford University with degrees in political science and philosophy. He is both a writer and an adventurous traveler, with a plethora of interests. For example, how to become a street photographer, how to bake bread, how to execute a 180-degree turn while driving at high speed, woodworking, learning Japanese, making shirts, and many more. Surprisingly, he managed to master all these skills. So, how did he do it? The author summarized a method, which he calls, micromastery. He even gave himself an interesting title, The Lifelong Micromastery Practitioner. Next, I will interpret this book for you in two parts. In the first part, we'll explore what exactly micromastery is and its significance. In the second part, we'll uncover how to achieve micromastery ourselves. Okay, let's talk about what micromastery means. Pay attention, this term is quite peculiar. How should we define micromastery? You see, it doesn't imply that you're completely unskilled, nor does it mean you've become a master. It's different from being in an intermediate state, like having a superficial understanding or only knowing a little about something. Let's take a simple example to help you understand. For instance, writing a novel, if you only know how to construct sentences and paragraphs, or when it comes to archery, you can only pull the bow. These situations don't count as micromastery, they fall under superficial understanding. Micromastery, on the other hand, refers to being able to complete a minimal loop within a particular craft. What does that mean? Let's go back to the examples of writing a novel and learning archery. For writing a novel, you might not know how to write every type of novel, and your grasp of the writing process might be limited. However, if you can conceive a complete story and present it to others, without the expectation of it becoming a bestseller or even being published, even if only a few readers get to read it, that's fulfilling the minimal loop a novel requires, from ideation to writing and being read by an audience. Similarly, with archery, regardless of whether your aim is accurate or not, at least you need to complete the process of drawing the bow, aiming, and shooting. This entire sequence constitutes a minimal loop. So, micromastery refers to achieving this minimal loop in a particular skill. Alright, now that we've discussed what micromastery is, let's answer another question, what's the use of micromastery? Why is it worth exploring? Many people might think it's simply about satisfying your curiosity and trying out various colorful activities. However, micromastery is far from being that straightforward. Don't view this book as a shallow collection of skills, teaching you how to draw, make shirts, or brew craft beer, for instance. After reading this book, I felt a strong impression that, fundamentally, micromastery is not merely a means of satisfying curiosity, it's a life stance that requires courage. You may have noticed that previous generations knew a little bit of everything. However, as generations progress, the number of small skills we master in our daily lives diminishes. This isn't solely because our generation is lazy, it's because society's division of labor has become increasingly specialized. Every specific task can spawn a dedicated profession, freeing you from doing it yourself. This phenomenon of fine-tuned specialization carries two messages. On one hand, it represents the world's positive development, as our lives become more convenient. On the other hand, it comes with a side effect, it may unconsciously block our potential to excel in certain areas. When we seek to learn a new skill, these specialized professions may signal that we don't need to bother, after all, we might find it challenging to match their expertise. As a result, our perspectives on problems may become increasingly narrow, 
akin to what Charlie Munger described as the man with a hammer tendency in his book, Poor Charlie's Almanac. In the eyes of a man with only a hammer, everything looks like a nail. This book aims to break down the walls that restrain us, hidden within our minds, through the pursuit of micromastery. Surface level benefits of micromastery include expanding your range of knowledge and utilizing your brain. But in reality, micromastery embodies a form of optimistic self improvement. It helps you shed certain societal constraints, enabling you to observe the world with childlike curiosity. You no longer suppress your own interests, nor view your curiosity as naive and superficial. If you encounter someone like this in your life, even if you aren't familiar with them, you'll likely sense the vitality that comes with their love for exploration. Looking at the issue from another perspective adds even more interest. On a technical level, micromastery may seem like adding just one more small craft to your repertoire, being skilled in masonry, bicycle repair, woodworking, and so on. It may not seem like a grand accomplishment at first glance. However, if a person's entire life is spent in this manner, what will their life become? Micromastery is, in essence, establishing a personal lottery system in life. Each small skill is like a lottery ticket, and you never know when one will pay off and have an astounding impact. Take Steve Jobs, the co-founder of Apple, for example. During his university days, he took a calligraphy class, not expecting any practical application for it. However, ten years later, when he entered the IT industry, he used what he learned in calligraphy to design the fonts and spacing for the first Apple Macintosh computer. The incorporation of artistic typography set Apple's products apart from other companies that solely cater to customer needs. Or consider Gunpei Yokoi, one of the founders of Nintendo. His amateur interests included playing the piano, dancing, diving, and tinkering with toys. In the 1960s, Nintendo was selling Hanafuda cards in Japan, but the business was declining. Yokoi, during his free time, created a peculiar device using discarded materials, a mechanical spring arm that extended upon pressing a button. This prototype became Nintendo's first successful product, the Ultra Hand. By turning his micromastery in toymaking into a successful invention, Yokoi helped Nintendo transition into a toy company and further expand into the electronic entertainment industry with the creation of Super Ball and Ultra Scope. Many similar examples exist, such as Nobel Prize winning medical scientist Carl Corey. He honed his micromastery in sewing and crafts during childhood, which he later applied to revolutionary surgical techniques. Nobel laureate Luis Alvarez, having achieved micromastery in technical drawing and woodworking early on, was able to construct any experimental apparatus he needed and made significant contributions to the field of experimental particle physics. As you can see, the difference between these micromastery practitioners and ordinary individuals lies in their focus. They are not simply concerned about the utility of a skill, instead, they view their life as a continuously unfolding lottery system. They are more interested in exploring the boundaries of this system and what intriguing state they can reach. So, even if you're not lucky enough to achieve major accomplishments, your life becomes more exciting because of this lottery system. Many people say life is a marathon, not just about running too fast in the beginning, which would leave you exhausted later. It's more about the possibility of changing the game, trying various ways of running, and even altering your perception of running itself. Alright, now on to the second part. Let's figure out how to achieve micromastery quickly. Many of us have experienced the frustration of starting something with enthusiasm but losing interest quickly and abandoning it. However, how can we make the most of this initial burst of motivation and achieve minimal avoidance? The author, in the process of learning, has continually explored and summarized. They discovered a particular paradox, on one hand, learning anything valuable seems to require a significant amount of time, so if they can't commit to it, they might as well not start. On the other hand, they often find themselves interested in many things, thinking, it would be great if I knew how to do that. In this awkward state between mastery and incompetence, the author realized that to achieve micromastery, they must start with something exceptionally small. By deriving pleasure from these small achievements, you can ignite your astonishing learning potential. The limitation of micromastery is what keeps you interested in the world. The author mentions four key points in this book. 1. Identify the entry-level skills. 2. Obtain background support. 3. Create clear feedback. 4. Establish an achievable challenge. Let's explain each of them one by one. 
First, we need to find the entry-level skills, recognizing the critical aspects of the skill to avoid quickly exhausting our initial enthusiasm. In the past, when discussing entry-level skills, people often thought of starting by understanding theories and methods through books and thinking deeply. However, pay attention to this book's emphasis on four words, entry-level skills. The term, skills, implies that you shouldn't start with methods but with practice. So, what are entry-level skills? They refer to starting with something you can accomplish. For instance, Alexander Hopkins, a world-class medieval instrument maker, had a difficult time when he began self-learning to make violins in his youth. With no formal training, he bought a book on instrument making but struggled to understand it. Disheartened, he decided to try his hand at creating a simple violin by imitating pictures. The first violin he made was in terrible condition, barely playable. However, upon revisiting the book, he gradually comprehended some concepts. The author discovered that we often give up because, in the initial phase of learning, we tend to focus on basic skills or theoretical foundations, which can lead to a sense of disappointment when the process differs significantly from our expectations. However, in reality, every micromastery can have an entry-level skill. These skills act as internal information. You can first find industry experts and follow them to perform a simple task, so your initial attempt exceeds the average level of beginners. This foundation then guides you on the path of micromastery. In some cases, entry-level skills account for a significant portion of micromastery time, becoming its primary component. In other instances, entry-level skills serve as a preliminary boost, encouraging us to engage in the activity, even if the initial completion isn't rapid. It at least improves our speed and allows us to endure hours of practice. For example, learning to parallel park is a challenging micromastery for beginners in driving. It requires simultaneous coordination of hands and feet, along with a perception of the wheels and the road's edge. However, we can pass the driving test in a short time, thanks to the various marks made on the car window by the instructor. This quickly grasped entry-level skill helps us achieve micromastery in parallel parking. Similarly, Public speaking is a daunting micromastery. For those lacking experience, speaking impromptu on an unfamiliar topic may seem impossible. However, even for such a challenging task, there are entry-level skills. Stand on the stage and honestly describe your thoughts, feelings, and actions. If you feel nervous and unprepared, you can directly tell the audience. If the given topic is in an unfamiliar domain, you can express your limitations in that area. Once you master these skills and start speaking, you might find that you can engage the audience and ask for their opinions. Suddenly, public speaking may not seem as terrifying as before. Alright, we've covered the first key point, finding the entry-level skills. The second key point is to obtain background support to design boosts and add some motivation to the process. For example, when learning music, getting suitable equipment not only enhances the experience but also creates a sense of ritual, helping you stay focused. An example is John, a guitar teacher, who started learning the guitar at the age of 26. He spent over $40,000 on a guitar to make his learning intentional. Despite borrowing money from friends, this expensive guitar motivated him not to waste even a few minutes a day and fostered his concentration. Background support goes beyond equipment, it includes the environment and people around us. Here's an interesting story I heard. A friend of a classmate was driving in New York, and the car navigation was set to Spanish. When asked why, he replied that he used the navigation to learn dialects. Through navigation, he already learned Portuguese and Italian, and after half a year, he nearly mastered Spanish too. Besides, he became familiar with the streets of New York, rarely getting lost. This exemplifies how background support can aid in achieving micromastery. We need to create an environment that supports our goals and assists in counteracting the pressures of the task. For instance, if your goal is weight loss, clearing your home of snacks, uninstalling food delivery apps on your phone, and finding like-minded fitness friends can provide essential background support, boosting your chances of success. Moving on to the third key point of achieving micromastery, creating clear feedback and receiving positive and negative feedback to establish a positive feedback loop. You might have experienced the feeling of being genuinely interested in something and enjoying learning, but as time goes on, procrastination becomes evident. This often happens not because of the activity itself but because, before starting the learning process, we haven't carefully considered how to address the lack of clear feedback or insufficient feedback. 
When learning a new skill, if you can't produce any impressive work or receive definite feedback, a sense of disappointment and frustration can lead to giving up. In reality, we want to apply what we learn immediately in real life and see tangible results to continue our pursuit. For instance, the author mentions their experience of street photography and the importance of creating clear feedback. Feedback can come from various sources, such as major media platforms, social media, magazines, or comments from colleagues, friends, and social groups. Additionally, based on my own experience, teaching can be an excellent method to create clear feedback. No matter what micromastery you've achieved, once you turn yourself into a teacher and actively find ways to teach others, even if you're learning and teaching simultaneously without compensation, this positive feedback loop can have a tremendous impact. Sharing your experiences with others and using their attention to boost your willpower is a beneficial approach. If you want to achieve micromastery, consider creating an environment that supports your goals, seeks clear feedback, and utilizes teaching as a method of reinforcing your skills. The last key point is to establish repeatability, which is an essential aspect of micromastery. Micromastery should be something that can be continuously repeated, and most importantly, you can improve as you go through it repeatedly over time. The author shares an example where he set himself a micromastery task, whenever he went to a coffee shop, he had to draw the cups, spoons, and plates inside the shop. Sometimes he drew them meticulously, like a still life drawing, while other times he hastily sketched them in a few strokes, taking less than a minute. However, he found that by continuously repeating this simple process, he felt increasingly confident, and his observation skills improved. Many times, we can eliminate self-doubt and worry about making mistakes or not drawing well by setting specific timeframes and repeatable patterns. By doing so, we can create an environment that fosters confidence and skill improvement. To emphasize once again, adopting the micromastery method doesn't mean you have to invest a significant amount of time or dedicate your entire life to it. Instead, it is about rekindling the sense that opportunities for growth and learning are infinite. So, why not give it a try? Lastly, I would like to share some personal insights. After reading this book, you will likely have a similar feeling as me, the author's ultimate purpose is not to make us experts in everything but rather to convey an attitude towards learning and an optimistic spirit. As mentioned in the book, pessimism is a deceiver, it grabs our attention but never allows us to participate in change. Micromastery, on the other hand, can defeat pessimism and help us achieve genuine transformation. At some point, you may feel discouraged due to hardships and may believe that you've wasted your life. However, you will remember that at least you achieved certain micromastery, and there are still other things you can do. So, don't miss any opportunity to achieve micromastery in life because these seemingly insignificant accomplishments could be your lucky breaks in life's lottery. Congratulations! You have completed another book. Thank you all for listening to the Tim Booker channel. Please subscribe to Tim Booker channel like this video, and share this valuable knowledge with your friends. Let's combine wisdom with practice to achieve our financial goals and create a better future. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye.